I remember years ago, I was 31 years old, and I got a phone call from a man named Norman Vincent Peale. And Norman, if you don't know him, wrote the original book called The Power of Positive Thinking. He was a religious leader, and he's like, the world needs a different mindset, because we're all finding what's wrong. By the way, I have a simple phrase I remind myself and everybody else. What's wrong is always available, isn't it? There's always something wrong if you look for it, but so is what's right. What's right is always available as well. And training your brain to do that is so critical because otherwise problems will overwhelm you, especially during certain times like winter when several challenges happen once, financial, emotional, your body, your family. That's a winter. It doesn't matter what winter is outside, it's the one you're experiencing inside. And we gotta be able to get ourselves through it and out of it. So in order to do that, we gotta understand something different. So Norman calls me up, it was early in my career, and says, I'd really like to meet you. How about you come and be my guest at one of my seminars? It was up in Toronto, Canada. So I was totally honored. I flew up. I go to meet this legend. He was 92 years old. I was 32. That's right. So a 60-year difference between us. And I remember I said, Norman, I said, uh, I said, how come you're still doing seminars at 92? And he says, well, Tony, there's still a few negative people out there. <laughs> right? And I remember I, I had this chance to be in, imagine somebody 92. Like when he was born, there was no cars, right? This is years ago. Right, 30 years ago, roughly, or a little less, 28 years ago. No cars, no computers, not going to the moon. Think of all the things in his lifetime, 92 years, he'd seen. So I said, Norman, I said, I really want to know, I mean, you've, you've lived such an extraordinary time in history, such a long part of history. What's the most important thing you've learned? What's the most important thing people need to know to have an extraordinary quality of life? And he didn't hesitate a moment. He said, Tony, they need to understand the power of problems. I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, most people are trying to avoid problems. They're, they think if there's a problem that's happened, they've done something wrong. And he said, they don't understand that problems are gifts. He said, they don't understand the value of it. In fact, I remember, you know, years ago, you know, people quoted one of the things I said decades ago. And it was, you know, if you don't have problems, he said, first of all, the only people without problems are people in cemeteries. And I smile and I say, yeah, I, I heard that phrase. He goes, yeah, I said that in 1932, whatever it was, right? It's like, holy shit. And, and I said, and he said, but Tony, they don't finish the whole quote. My quote was, the only people that have problems are in cemeteries. So if you don't have a problem, you better get on your knees and start praying for one because, and I'll never forget how he said this. He said, Tony, problems are a sign of life. See, if you don't have problems, you're either confused or you're calling it a challenge, which is wonderful, but everyone has it. If you're in business, you have problems. And what makes you a great leader is you solve problems quickly. You're not focused on the problem, you're focused on the solution. But he said, you know when this really came to me, Tony, the power of problems? He said, I was speaking at this public speaking event, and I was at this day, I said, there was a luncheon first, and there was a group of speakers, and one of them was Gene Tunney. Gene Tunney was the world boxing championship of the world, the champion of the world back then. And he said he was unbelievably muscular fit like he'd never seen a man before. And he said he was sitting beside me at lunch and I said, can I ask you a question, Gene? He goes, yeah. He said, uh, how do you get muscles like that? And Gene Tunney's response really, he wasn't, you know, Norman wasn't prepared for it. He said, he turned to me and said, do you really want to know or are you just asking? And Norman said in his head, I thought, I'm just asking, but I'm not going to say that now. No, I really want to know, right? And he said, I built these muscles by every day pushing against unbelievable amounts of resistance. And that's what sculpts these muscles and gives me this power, this strength. And Norman said he, he thought about it for about an hour afterwards. He said, Tony, I realize God gives us problems for the same way to build our soul's muscle, our spiritual muscles. Because in dealing with those, we have to push, we have to break through. And he said, that's what sculpts our souls. That's what makes us proud of who we are. I put a little metaphor here, a couple of them for you. I just want to remind you that when you decide you can't find something also, remember I said what you look for, you'll find? When you decide you can't find something, you'll also discover you won't find it. Because whether you believe something's true, whether you believe it's not, you're right. How many of you have the experience of having somebody say to you something like, can you find me the salt? You think to yourself, hey, would you go in the cabins and get me the salt? And as you're walking there, you're thinking, I don't know what the salt is. You walk up there, you open up, I don't know where it is. And you really do look, don't you? You really look. But you already have this belief that says, I can't find the salt. 
So what happens? Two minutes later, you go, it's not in here. They go, what are you talking about? It's right there on the shelf. You go, no, it's not. They walk in, they walk right beside you, reach right in front of your face and go, what is this? And what is it? How many have had this happen to you? Now, the salt wall's already there. You said, Tony, what I look for, I'll find. Yes, what you look for in earnest, you'll find. See, what you really want the answer to, you'll get. But you go, why am I so happy? But you really don't want to know the answer? You're not going to get the answer. Or what's really great about this person? You won't get an answer. It's only what you seek for in earnest. If you don't look for something, you won't find it. You're right. If you don't commit yourself to finding it, you won't. Good thing for you to remember. What do you do when an upset happens? Well, let me give you an example of what I learned from racing school. It changed my whole life. I race cars, formula cars. And so I went to several different schools, by the way, to do this. And I'll never forget, in my first school, the first thing they really taught us at this one school for racing is they said, the first thing you got to do is you got to know how to recover. You got to know how to recover before anything else. How to drive a car, you guys know how to do. How to go forward, you know how to do that. What you got to do is learn how to recover when you hit the skids in the road. Because if you don't know how to do that, your racing career is going to be rather short or rather painful. And most of you are trying to race through life. And a lot of you are having a rather painful time because you don't recover very well. Or you recover, but in the process of recovering, you smash in everybody else's car along the way. And that makes the next trip around a little resentful for the people. They see you coming by, they kind of avoid you a little bit, going, I'm not getting too close to this doctor, this staff member, this person, this accountant, this secretary, this telephone person, the person around the calendar. I'm not doing that. Because if I do, they're going to smash me up too in the process of them trying to recover. So what they do is they put you in a skid car where they make you go through the process of about to crash, where they knock you off track. And what it is is the skid car, they got a little computer. They fire off this computer and what it does, it has a little lift and it lifts one of your wheels and you never know which direction or when. So you're screaming around the track, screaming, 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 and you're not doing full speed like 140 miles an hour. They start you a little slower, like we're doing this morning. You go about 60, 70 miles an hour. But 60, 70 miles an hour on a track is pretty intense and you're going right for a wall and all of a sudden, you start to skid out of control. And what they tell you in advance is that what you got to do is when you start to get out of control, there's only one key. Look where you want to go. Focus on where you want to go. Do not focus on what you're afraid of. Now, what do people do in life? We focus on what we fear and we get more of whatever we focus on. That's what they tell you there. They say, look, whatever you focus on, that's where you're going to go. Whatever you focus on, you're going to get more of. You focus on the wall, you're going to get a lot of wall. Real fast, you're going to crash. What you immediately got to do is focus on what you want. Not where you think you're going, not where you think you are. If you're not where you want to be, if you're not where you're wanting to go, focus on where you want to go. Immediately, don't hesitate. They said, now what you're going to have to do is when you do this, it won't feel like it's working at first because you'll still feel like you're going into the wall. Because what happens, you have so much momentum in that direction that even when you focus on where you want to go, there'll still be a little bit of momentum in that direction and there'll be a little bit of a lag time before the car turns. So don't, because you don't seem to be turning, turn back and look, because you do, you're going to go right there and crash. Keep there. You have to use that F word. What is it? Faith. So what happens is you turn, you're going in, going in, and what do most people do? First of all, most people don't even turn. What do I do the first time? I'm screaming along, screaming along, all of a sudden I start going to control, and go, ah, I'm looking right at the wall. My instructor, last minute, saves my life by grabbing my head and going, and pulling my head physically in the direction I should be looking, which is directly 90 degrees opposite of where I was going, right? I'm heading for the wall. That's where I need to look. So all about the crash, it goes like this, and I'm pulling my head over here. And... Sudden, go on. I want to look back. Oh, when are we gonna? Do? And the last second, it turned away. And I went, Oh my god, my heart's beating out of me. I said, Maybe I should try a different sport. <laughs> I thought, Now, this is a good metaphor for life, so let me do it again. So I got there, and you never know when they're gonna do it. You're going, you're going, you're going. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to love racing again, racing, racing. All of a sudden, this is I started going, oh, and you know what I did? Boom. I pulled my head. I'm like pulling my head in this direction because I keep wanting to go on this way. Look at what it is pulling, and I'm waiting to wait. And sure enough, the car turns just in time. 
And after a while, you know what you do? Something happens, you notice what it is. You don't stare at what it is. You don't figure out what it is. You don't go, that's a wall. Smacking that, what will it be like to smack that? Ooh, if I smack that, my body will go here, my head will go there. No, what happens is, you see the wall, you know what it is? You only acknowledge a problem long enough to know what it is and then move on. Know what it is, boom, focus on where I want to go. The minute I can identify what it is and that's not where I want to go, boom. So I'm heading for it, boom, in the car. And it's like, now, now you just, boom. You get off it so fast. Focus on what you want, and you'll get more of it. Focus on what you fear, and you'll get more of that. Focus on what you want, and you'll get more of it. Focus on what you fear, and you'll get more of that. How do self-awareness, self-assessment, and self-improvement begin? And how do they continue over time? Try to imagine What is going to be your field of mastery in life? How do you want to impact the world? What are you most passionate about? How do you create a career out of your top passion in life? If you can figure that out and become definite about it and be crystal clear about it, and a lot of people do that. They say, well, I'm not that big, so they never start. But as I always say, you know what, no matter how small you start, start something that matters. Begin it. If I began my career looking at my heroes, looking at a, a Wayne Dyer or a Tony Robbins or a Marianne Williamson, a Deepak Chopra, a, a Jim Rohn back in the day, or, or looking at people like Og Mandinos who'd sold millions of books, or, or even the, the famous books that you saw, millions and millions and millions of copies. If I gauged myself to that and thought that was the expectation, I would never begin. You can just step up into the position, still be humble, still take advice. Now, this doesn't mean that you're a pushover, right? This doesn't mean that you just listen to what everyone says. You don't make any decisions. No, it actually means that you show respect to their experience. And when it comes time to make a decision, you get the best input and then you make a decision and you explain your decision. And if your decision is wrong, you admit it. And if it's not wrong, you push forward. I want you to change this paralysis through action. Because if you sign up for that class, if you go on that retreat, if you create your art, if you post that blog post, if you start that business, you will be proving to yourself through the actions that you're taking that you don't care what other people think.